I don't know if you can see this, but it's hailing outside. Hail. <sighs> Welcome to day two of quarantine. Believe it or not, it's actually a couple of hours later. It just started up again, and it looks like it's starting to slow down. But, yeah, um, that's sleet. This is nuts. Norway's usually warmer than Madison this time of year. Or at least about the same temperature and... Let me close that. Uh, same temperature and climate as Madison this time of year. And it's usually a little bit later that Madison starts pulling away and becoming significantly colder than this area in Norway. Um, I'm in Bergen, which was in Vestland for reference. So the western part of Norway, coastal... So, warmer. You can even see that there are actually blue skies out there, but not in the hotel area. <sighs> yep. So, it's the next day. Um, not much has changed. Surprise, surprise. Day two of quarantine is a lot like day one, only I've actually been able to sleep. <laughs> not only have I been able to sleep, I slept for 15 hours in a previous 24-hour period. Which, wow. And a previous 24-hour period, technically that period could start right now and it would still be 15 hours of sleep. This is about when I went to bed yesterday for a nap. And I made sure, when I was doing this, I made sure I set timers every roughly hour and 10 minutes to make sure I didn't go into a deep sleep. It's not great. I don't like doing it that way. I prefer sleeping my first day, basically. But mealtimes, not to mention being woken up in the morning by calls from the Norwegian government. Ah. So, oh boy, do they make sure that you are in quarantine. Um, I mean, I am. I haven't done anything even close to violating the terms of quarantine. I'm legitimately trying to do this the correct way. Which brings me to, oh boy, my travels. Um, I'm going to want to sit down for this. <sighs> okay, that's a little better. I'm just in the little corner by my bed. Let me move this. Ah, sorry for it being so rocky. Just want it to be kind of toward the center of the frame. <sighs> Image is a little noisy because of lack of light in here, because there isn't any light coming from that direction at all. And in fact, there's pretty much not a great way to film in here at all outside of light coming from the window, which is over that way reference. So I can add more light from that side. Well, actually that did help a little. Anyway, so I thought I would talk about my trip at this point because I didn't talk about that when my Welcome to Quarantine video yesterday because I was too tired to think. <laughs> I'm a lot better now sleep-wise. That's good. Ooh, I do need to shave before my job interview today. Yet another job interview today. This is the fourth. So three video interviews. Um, yeah, this will be the third video interview. I've had one phone only interview as well, a phone screen. So third or fourth, depending on how you define it. Anyway, so the trip. Um, I don't know if I'm going to bother editing things in or if I'm just going to merge the video clips together. Don't know. I haven't really been feeling like doing much of anything lately, which you wonder why. So, um, I started my travels on Tuesday, which is the 20th of October in the year 2021, leaving my house to, so the travel tracker, uh, you didn't know, I post on Twitter and usually Facebook as well, a travel tracker every time that I go on a relatively complicated journey. Uh, I did it once as a joke going on the journey to get my vaccination, but in general, I post it whenever I'm on a complicated trip because one, people like to know updates on my status, and two, I kind of find it fun. So I, uh, this is really bushy. Hmm. And the light makes it look like this right here is super tall. It's not, it's just the light. Sorry, I keep getting distracted. It's almost as though my ADHD is on overdrive right now. So, um, 
take that off so I stop getting distracted as easily. So, the I have been packing for the previous several days. Uh, most things were packed. I had to repack over and over and over again with either additions to what I needed to bring with me, or my partner saying that I should bring my weighted blanket with me, which caused me to have to add another bag and repack everything again, to what happened right before I left. So the cab was to arrive at 9.10. They arrived at 9, which is fine. And I saw them arrive, so I went downstairs and closed up the last bag that I had. I had one bag that was open at the time in order to get medications in and out. So I closed it up, and a zipper sheared off in my hands. Not just popped off, not just, oh, the little tether part popped off. No, no, the zipper mechanism itself just sheared in half. So that was the start of my journey. Um... I should actually sit up a little. Yes, mutant is underway. Meow. So that was the start of my journey. I have been babying that bag ever since. It was a relatively cheap black duffel bag. Um, I could actually get it. Man, I showed it in a previous video, but it's a relatively cheap black duffel bag. I picked it up specifically to carry the tiny computer in before I got the cool case, but. It wasn't meant to be like check baggage or anything. This was a carry-on. And that bag was really heavy. But the zipper, I mean, the bag itself wasn't overstuffed or anything. In fact, there was plenty of slack on the top. It's just that the zipper wore from, I don't know, it being really badly made. Anyway, um, I'm probably going to end up throwing out the bag or at the very least greatly compressing it. And not worrying about it. Luckily, it was a double zipper. So, for reference, if you have a double zipper bag of any variety and one of the zippers breaks, you can use it as a single zipper bag, but you're going to be putting a lot more wear and tear in that one zipper. So I was babying it the entire way here. Luckily, I didn't need to open it for any inspections because that would have sucked. But I'll get to that in a bit. So, uh, get into the cab. It was a giant minivan for one person, which is fine because I had a lot of baggage with me. Um, take the bags out, wait at the bus stop for, uh, probably would have been about 20 minutes before they let me on the bus. And really letting me on the bus was me loading up my bags for the baggage area underneath the bus, and then my personal carry-on bags with me <clears throat> on a bus seat. And then me getting out of the bus again, so I didn't have to wear the mask the entire time. Um... So, for reference, um, I'll get to that, sorry. Again, brain is not wanting to think linearly right now. So, get on the bus. This has already been really annoying, because those bags are heavy. I had four bags with me. So, backpack, which is right here. Come on. Backpack, which my backpack's fairly small, and yes, I do have green duct tape on everything. I think I mentioned that in the previous video. But I have a strap of green duct tape on all of my bags. That way it's really easy to tell which ones are mine. So wearing backpack, carrying around the duffel bag that I have to ba baby, along with dragging two roller bags behind me. And I have bad shoulders, so I'm putting weight on my shoulders for my backpack, which admittedly my backpack was really light. Uh, the only things that I had in there of consequence weight-wise was my laptop. Which... I know I haven't done an actual video on it, but you can see how small and thin my laptop is. This thing is super light. It's, I want to say, 900 grams. I would weigh it, but I don't have a scale in this room. Um, backpack and portable monitor, which the portable monitor weighs very slightly less than my laptop even. My backpack wasn't in my backpack. My laptop in my backpack, plus my portable monitor. So I didn't exactly have a bunch of weight that way, but dragging things behind me strains my shoulders. And also having to carry a duffel bag, which was strapped across one shoulder or across the different... And I arranged it where it was across my neck instead of my shoulders, because while well, normally that's more prone to injury, in my case, my neck is significantly stronger than my shoulders are now. But anyway... It's a lot to carry. And, okay, bus to the airport. The bus ride was fairly uneventful. They usually aren't filled with events. 
Uh, in fact, the bus itself only had three people on it when it left Madison, or when it left downtown Madison. Uh, by the time we actually got to O'Hare, it was about half full, maybe a little under half full. So not too bad. Able to socially distance, was wearing my normal mask instead of the M92 mask. Uh, the reason why I did that was one, I was able to socially distance on the bus, so it wasn't that big of a deal. And two, the regular mask is more comfortable for me to wear longer term. I don't sweat as much in it, and we're... <laughs> Sweating's a problem, but okay, get off the bus. Um, for some reason, uh, Lufthansa, which is the airline that I was using, which is a German airline, from, if you couldn't tell from the name, actually has their departure from Terminal 1 in O'Hare. For those that aren't familiar with O'Hare, there are four terminals, one, two, three, and five. I'm sure there was a Terminal 4 at one point and it got demolished or something like that, but one, two, three, and five. And 5 is the international terminal. That's actually the terminal I expected to go through. This was in 1. Okay, it's a larger terminal and my least favorite terminal in O'Hare because the way they put the security checkpoints in, you have, okay, large terminal area, security checkpoint gate. So there's not, it's really crowded for most of the terminal. And I don't particularly like crowded places like that, especially during pandemic. But I had equipped my N95 mask when I got off the bus. So, okay, first thing I need to do, drop off baggage. Which meant that I was carrying all of my bags at once. That hurt. That hurt a lot. But I was able to drop off my bags. They didn't blink an eye about the fact that one of my checked bags was at exactly maximum weight. <laughs> and I do mean exact. When I weighed it right before leaving the house, it was less than 100 grams off which means it was within the margin of error of my scale. Uh, my smaller bag was very densely packed, but it being a smaller bag, it wasn't actually as heavy. The only thing in it was basically the weighted blanket and a couple of bits of clothing. So, um, okay, drop that off. Now I only have carry-on bag and the shoulder bag. Or a backpack and the carry-on bag, I should say. Go through airport security. So airport security was really easy. I am a TSA pre-check member because of how often I went through airport security pre-pandemic. It made sense not to mention one of my credit cards pays for it, so it cost me nothing. I should have gotten global entry instead, but alas, I didn't think about it when I first got it. And it's somewhat difficult for me to arrange the appointment for global entry now. What I'm planning on doing is trying to arrange it when I'm coming back from Norway, because that is one of the options that you have, is that you can do global entry on a return trip from International, and then I can just do it there in O'Hare while I'm already there. Anyway, um, it's a bit of a walk, and that carry-on bag was 12 kilos. That's a lot of weight to put on my neck, and the bag itself was not it was definitely not meant to handle that much weight. And again, it wasn't bulging at the seams or anything like that. It's just, it the shoulder strap was really plasticky and really it's just a cheapo bag. I don't even remember how much I paid for it or where I even got it from. Probably Amazon, probably really cheap, but whatever. Get to my gate. Um, I had been... Since I knew there was a broken zipper, I was trying to keep an eye out for places that I might be able to buy a new bag and just swap it in the airport itself. Unfortunately, there was nothing like that between my TSA exit point, or security, exiting airport security to get into the main terminal, and the gate point. So I looked it up online, and apparently there were no baggage areas until I got to Terminal 3. I did not want to walk anywhere near that far, so you know what, forget it, we're just going to go as it is, I'll just baby it the entire way. Get to my gate, sit down. Um, it's a long wait. I arrived intentionally quite a bit earlier. I could have taken a later bus, but then I would have only had an hour and a half between arrival at O'Hare and departure from O'Hare, and for those of you that don't know O'Hare very well, that's a really bad idea for an international flight. Turns out I would have actually been perfectly fine doing that, but 
I didn't know it at the time, and I sailed through airport security in, I don't know, 60 seconds. It was really quick. So, sit there, and they start making announcements. I cannot understand a word out of those announcements. Not only did the person have a very thick accent that I would normally have relative problems with, but they were wearing a mask while doing the overhead announcement speaker thing. So you have the fact that it's an overhead speaker that already jumbles people's words to begin with. Then you have a thick accent plus wearing a mask, making it where the microphone wasn't picking up very well. And basically I turned to... And that's about it. So... Turns out that there were two things. One, they were trying to replace the tickets from anybody who had a United Airlines ticket with a Lufthansa ticket. They're a code share for that particular flight, a code share for reference for those that don't fly very well, is when two airlines claim the same flight at the same time. It'll be flown by one of them, but it will also have a code for the different airline. Uh, it's mostly so you can fly from, say, for instance, Denver, Colorado to Bergen, Norway. <clears throat> the Denver to O'Hare flight might be under United, the rest of the flight would actually be under Lufthansa. But in order for a United ticket to go the entire way, they will have what's called a code share, where for United, it's a United flight the entire way. That way you don't have multiple tickets at once and complicate things. Anyway, they were doing that because they were checking documents at the gate. And uh, since I had arrived at O'Hare, and my ticket was entirely Lufthansa, I could safely ignore it. They checked my documents well in advance, actually. I submitted all my documentation three day, or two days before departure, because that was the earliest that I can do it. Because one of the things that they do is that they also try to check on your COVID status and things like that. And I am fully vaccinated. I have no problems revealing my COVID status. I have no problems proving my vaccination. So I try to do it as soon as possible. In addition, they also have the document check being passed on to Germany, which that will be important in a bit. So, um, okay. This is the point where I started having problems because the second thing that they announced is, oh, by the way, carry-on baggage is limited to eight kilograms. My bag is 12. I started panicking at that point. Um, I knew there was a chance that I would be over weight limit one, I didn't quite realize I was that far over. Uh, I had only weighed my bag that morning and decided, oh, screw it, I'm just going to take it with me. And two, the fact that they announced it to me meant, oh, crap, they're actually going to be weighing bags. Usually when you fly, they don't weigh the bag. In fact, they barely even look at the dang thing when you're getting on board other than, uh, that bag looks a little larger than our, you know, guideline state. Or this is a really small flight. We don't have a whole bunch of baggage area. Would you mind checking the bag? In this case, I couldn't check it, or didn't want to, because you're not supposed to check a bag that has a computer in it. I had my computer and my partner's switch in it, both relatively valuable things that, again, you're not supposed to check bags with valuables in them. And I also didn't pack the bag to be bumped around a whole bunch for, like, loading up in a baggage area, because they really chuck those things. The rest of my bags were packed with the idea that they'd be chucked and thrown around, and that would be fine. The computer probably would survive it, although I might have things pop out in the computer and bounce around in the case, destroying everything. But there's a chance it would be stolen. And just me, I just started panicking at the gate at that point. I had to eat some gummies to calm myself down. And before somebody asks, given that I was in Chicago and it would have been legal there, no, these were just regular ordinary gummy worms, not... Um, cannabinoid-based gummy worms or anything like that. I do not partake. But it's the texture that allows me to calm down. Um, I have a thing when it comes to my senses where I need positive sensations to drown out the negative sensations. And that includes chomping on gummy bears. Or gummy worms in this case. Where was I? Oh, right. So eventually they have us line up at the gate which means that I'm carrying that really heavy bag the entire time and trying to pretend that it's lighter than it really is. But Lufthansa, to their credit, actually board planes correctly. So if you've ever been on a flight, you will know that people and airlines board planes in a really dumb way, which is to say that they board flights 
where they board the front part first and then going toward the back. And then they board in like lumps that make no sense where you end up with a bunch of traffic on the, like the aisle going down to your seat. Lufthansa actually does board from rear to front, which is good. That's the way you should be boarding. Their groups are a little wonky, but at least they're boarding rear to front. That's better. Ideally, they'd be boarding center to outer and rear to front, but that's a lot more complicated, especially with families and so on. So anyway, I board. I put my bag up in the baggage thing, barely, because it's really heavy and it's really high up. And again, I have shoulder problems. So trying to put, like, I cannot keep my arms up like this for very long. They will eventually start sagging and go down because my shoulders are not very strong for muscles like that. They're most of my muscles are keeping my shoulder in place instead. But eventually do that, sit down and realize there's nobody sitting by me. In fact, on the flight itself, after people moved from the initial departure, there was no one sitting in any seat bordering me. And I was in um, premium coach, not just regular coach. So I actually had a large amount of space around me. If it weren't for the fact that there were regulations saying otherwise, technically it would have actually been safe for me to not be masked because I had two meters distance to the next nearest person in a plane. Do you have any idea how hard that is to pull off? Uh, unfortunately, the seats were very hard where I couldn't like lift up an armrest to have an extra space or anything like that, but I did get to use one of the seats as a, I'm just going to put my things under that seat. Um, speaking of regulations, masking. So Lufthansa, on their website, requires N95 masks. Or technically it's KN95 or N95. Turns out they actually did allow for the standard five-layer mask that you might be able to buy cheapo disposables of, and I have tons of, but they didn't announce that on their website, and I didn't want to risk it. So I actually bought a package of N95 masks before leaving. N95 masks are more comfortable than regular KN masks are to me, other than the bands. Hold on, let me go grab one. So this is an N95 mask. Yes, I know it's backwards for you. Um, N95 masks, they go out like this, where this part goes over your nose, this part goes under your chin, like that. And there are two, on this mask at least, two rubber bands. So if I were to put this on, apologies for the muffled audio, It goes on something like this. So there's a little pinching area to make sure that this forms a proper seal. Underneath the chin, which because of how large my face is, this will start riding up as I'm speaking, so apologies in advance. And then the rubber bands, one goes toward the top part of my head, you can see it going up, and the other one down below. The problem is that this, it's even already started happening, it's hitting right here. This is the most sensitive part of my ear, in my case. And if I'm also wearing glasses, like so, you'll notice it hits and it crosses right at about the same area. If I'm also wearing headphones on top of it, it gets clamped down to all of this. So in other words, my ears are being pinched like crazy. I am technically was supposed to be wearing these masks, the N95 masks, basically the time that I entered the airport to when I arrived in this room, um, which I was for reference. The only time I took off my mask was to replace the mask because I sweat through one of these. I overheat really easily. And that's another thing that this does. It does not allow the area in front. Uh, yeah, okay, The you can sort of see where the lines were on the mask. Yesterday it was a lot more obvious, but the whole point of the mask is to make sure that it forms a proper seal around your mouth, which causes me to overheat. Um, if any part of my head ends up covered in some way, I start overheating a bit. And maybe I'll do another video about the weird way that I overheat, but long story short, I was sweating like crazy. Um, 
in the airport itself, I noticed that I stopped sweating at one point. Not because I wasn't super hot, but because I dehydrated myself enough to stop sweating. That happened again on the flight itself until I repositioned my mask and I decided not to wear my headphones. So the flight was relatively quiet. Sorry, itchy nose. Uh, the flight itself was relatively quiet because there were so few people nearby me. So I didn't really need the headphones. And I hadn't been wearing them on the bus because I was intentionally trying to keep my ears open because I knew the mask was going to bother them. So all I did was basically take my glasses off for almost the entire flight. Uh, the flight itself was actually fine. The food was surprisingly good on the flight. I wasn't expecting that. It was a little on the sparse side, especially the water. Uh, so in the US, depending on who you have as a flight attendant, you will either receive the bare minimum amount of water for a flight, or you will receive liters upon liters of water because the flight attendants are older school and realize just how much water you go through on such a dehydrating flight. I dehydrate faster than a normal person on top of it, so I require large amounts of beverage. Luckily, I had large amounts of beverage with me. I made sure I had bottles of water. I filled up my water bottle, or I mentioned that I had stopped sweating in O'Hare, and that was the point where I went, okay, yeah, no, I need to get water in me fast. So I have a half liter bottle with me. It's actually in the fridge in the room right now, but half liter bottle, I downed it, filled it up, started downing it, filled it up again. Uh, when I arrived on the plane itself, because I was in premium class, they already had a bottle of water sitting in a cup holder, which I downed. And I basically kept doing that to try to maintain my water levels. To give you an idea, I usually drink around three plus or minus half a liter per day of water. And I hit that barely. So I was a bit dehydrated by the time I got off the plane, but went through all of that, then arrived in Frankfurt, Germany at about seven in the morning, local time. So midnight, brain time. I tried to sleep on the plane. Usually I'm really good about sleeping on planes. I sleep really well when I'm traveling because the slight movement actually rocks me to sleep. Uh, I... I am hated by all of my traveling companions because I actually can sleep on flights and so on. This was a flight that I couldn't sleep very well on, and it's because of the mask. Again, I was overheating around my mouth. Heat is one of the few ways that I have... I really need to do a video about how I sleep and deal with overheating. Heat is one of the few ways that I cannot sleep, and constantly overheating on the flight meant that I wasn't going to be sleeping anytime soon. Didn't help that I was wearing long pants. I should not have worn long pants for the flight. I didn't realize it. I was just thinking, oh, arrival temperatures are cool enough where I should wear long pants. So I'll just wear long pants. It'll be fine, right? <sighs> yeah, I think the airport itself, they had the temperature in the airport about 30 C. That was a horrible, terrible mistake. So arrive in Frankfurt. In the Frankfurt airports... This is the first time I've ever been to the Frankfurt airport. I have been to an airport in Germany once before, but that was in Berlin, and that was also 16 years ago. So, very different experience. Arrive in the Frankfurt airport, and they apparently have a terminal for just um, Americans, basically, or people that haven't gone through EU customs. And at the moment, that's almost exclusively the U.S., there are other countries in the world, of course, outside of the EU, but they're not allowed to travel to Germany at the moment, so it's basically just U.S. flights coming in. And you walk from there to customs, which meant carrying that heavy bag again. And again, I have been babying it, and I actually did have to open up the bag because that's where my medication was, because I took my medication for the morning, that morning. So, yeah. On top of it, because my quote-unquote night was significantly shorter than normal, one of my medications that I take at night causes me to be very drowsy for about eight hours. I was not exactly all that awake that morning. The terminal is very large and empty, so that was a relatively long walk. Eventually arrive at customs, and that's where I started having an anxiety attack, because 
everybody else, when I arrived at customs, I had stopped by the bathroom on the way type of thing. So I wasn't with the rest of my flight. I was with a different flight when I arrived in customs. But everybody else had a lot of documentation on them. They had like a pamphlet, not really a pamphlet, more like a booklet of various types of documentation that they all had in their hands along with their U.S. passports as they were going through the non-EU passport part of customs, which had me start freaking out going, I don't have anything like that. All I have is my passport and ticket because the airline was supposed to handle all of that for me. Turns out they did. That was the quickest I have ever gone through customs. It was a relatively long line in front of me and I still got through in five minutes. Props to the Germans on that. They are very efficient when it comes to customs. Oh, speaking of German efficiency. So one of my favorite moments was... When I, when we all got aboard the flight from Chicago to Frankfurt, usually when you get on flights and they lock the doors, they say something along the lines of, doors have been locked, thank you everybody for taking your seats. In the most stereotypical example of German punctualness and precision of language that I've ever heard, just the announcement on the overhead was, flight boarded, click. Just, I loved that so much. Um, oh, right. Something else about that flight. Again, I have no... This is a stream of consciousness video. I apologize in advance. It's already a half an hour long and I haven't even gotten to Norway yet. Um, they had Wi-Fi aboard on the flight. And the sign also indicated that they had GSM cell, cell service. Turns out... That outside of the United States, some airlines do in fact have GSM service aboard the flight itself. Uh, GSM, for reference, is a cell standard that's used by most of the world outside of the United States. Uh, United States is a split between GSM and CDMA. Uh, CDMA providers are Verizon, Sprint, US Cellular. GSM providers are T-Mobile, AT&T. We don't really have too many more providers at this point. Hell, T-Mobile actually on Sprint right now. But anyway. Um, and turns out that they are allowed to have a cell repeater on their flight itself. As long as they're not over U.S. airspace. So when we left U.S. airspace to go over the Atlantic, they turned on a cell signal and my phone actually gained cell signal. Sort of. Uh, unfortunately... The way, so my provider is Google Fi. It's Google's cell provider that basically uses a combination of T-Mobile, US Cellular, and a few other provide, few other smaller providers, but it'll switch back and forth as necessary. Plus it has international roaming for free, so I'm actually using my cell phone here, but the international roaming part only works on a geolocated fence. So I'm going to be very interested to see if I have that same surface on the way back, if it works then. Because all it saw was, there's a cell signal, but I can't get data from it. Even though it was using a data provider that the moment I arrived in Germany, my phone went, oh, I'm going to switch you over to Deutsche Telekom now, which is T-Mobile, strangely enough. Um, one moment, and it switches my per phone over to using Deutsche Telekom. So that's why I'm wondering on the way back. Um, also, internet access they had various internet-based plans, and I chose the most expensive one, which was 24 hours of service, but allowed for everything, including VPN. Turns out they block VPN providers, so I'm debating whether it's worth my money to go yell at them for that and ask for a refund. So I couldn't connect, or it, they also blocked Discord, so I couldn't talk with my friends on Discord at the time. They basically had a web and IRC open, that was about it. So anyway, um, Frankfurt Airport. I arrive. By the time I arrived, my gate had already changed. Uh, that It had changed basically almost the moment I had arrived in Frankfurt. I just didn't bother looking until I was outside of customs. So I walked down to where my gate had changed to. This was a very, very quiet area. This is the quietest I have ever seen a major airport terminal during normal business hours. I mean, keep in mind, by the time I got out of customs, it was probably, I don't know, 7.45, 8 o'clock in the morning. So we're not exactly talking about 5 in the morning or 3 in the morning like I've been in Heathrow before. So it should have been fairly busy, but there was nobody around. Socially distancing was easy. 
and it was super quiet, and I, I really liked that. Uh, it turns out Frankfurt also has a lot of creature comforts. So, for instance, they have a movie theater that's available for you to go into. Um, they have a lot of very comfortable chairs that aren't pay chairs, unlike most places. They have wide open spaces. They actually have video game rooms where they looked like there was Xbox One consoles set up. Uh, it, I'm assuming based off of the controller. They were definitely consoles. Um, unfortunately, that was next to a smoking lounge. That was a really bad spot to put it. Uh, and also, because pandemic, I didn't want to go into such a place. And besides, I had a really heavy bag with me that I was still lugging around everywhere. I uh, arrived at the gate, went over to a little, like, set up your laptop area to go plug in, because... So, I mentioned this in a previous video, but my portable battery charger... Or, not portable battery charger. My portable charger thing, I said, this thing here, is too powerful for that airline seat, so I couldn't charge that device with me. I had to use my USB-A to C cord and just charge one device at a time very, very slowly. I mean, it worked, but it meant that I couldn't use my laptop without depleting its battery and or other batteries. Yeah, anyway. Um, so I plugged everything in, so let it charge, and opened up my email to review work email. So I have a separate email address for anything like business-related for myself. That way, it doesn't interfere with anything else. And while I was pulling my email, I saw an email from the airline saying that they had changed my gate again to the opposite side of the same terminal. Normally, I like walking in airports. It's a way to stretch my legs, especially during a layover. I frequently arrive at the gate and go, okay, I've got an hour. I'm going to go laps around this place and start finding nifty things and so on. I couldn't do that because of how heavy my bags were this time. But arrive at the other gate. This one was more crowded, but it's fine. It's where I started noticing people were not abiding by guidelines. In Germany, you are required to wear that same masking rule everywhere. When you are in an airport or on a plane, you are not allowed, and it is supposed to be strictly enforced, you are not allowed to take off the mask. If you are eating, it's supposed to be a lift up mask, put food in, put down mask. That was not being adhered to at all. And something I noticed throughout the entire trip was the closer I got to Norway, the less mask rules were being enforced, which is the opposite of what I was expecting. Um, so eventually they start boarding, which they boarded really early. They boarded 45 minutes early, whereas my international flight was only 30 minutes early. I found that weird. So at the gate, I didn't see a plane nearby, but it was also kind of hard to see all of the little jet bridges. So I was like, okay, maybe I just didn't see it. Has walked downstairs, which there was no elevator for or escalator. That's a little weird. To arrive at a shuttle. So they moved my gate twice, even though it was a shuttle, a really long shuttle, actually, to get to where the plane actually was, which was basically in the middle of a parking lot. I'm really confused by all the gate moves. We get there. I have to go walk up the steps up to the plane because they had no jet bridge. With the heavy bag, my right shoulder is actually yelling at me still from this. But made it, got seated. I was seated in an exit row, so I had to make sure all of my bags were up above, which compounded problems because now I'm putting two bags up, lifting up with my shoulder, and had a quiet flight because there was no Wi-Fi. It's been a long time since I've been on a plane with no Wi-Fi. In fact, the last time that happened, it was because the Wi-Fi was broken, not because the flight never had it. But apparently... The shorter flights from Lufthansa still don't have Wi-Fi installed. Eh, whatever. It's only a two-hour flight. Arrive in Bergen. Panic attack number two. Or, sorry, anxiety attack number two. This was not a full-blown panic attack. This was just anxiety. Because, in theory, I had submitted all of the... Or, my partner had submitted the documentation proving that I am a romantic partner of a Norwegian citizen, which means I would be allowed into the country. And I knew that I would be going into quarantine. I had joked around saying that I wonder if 
they were actually generating an EU COVID passport for me with all the prep work that Lufthansa was doing in advance, which it's possible that they were, but I never received it, so I definitely couldn't prove it. They had us leave the flight and get into this very tiny area. And the first thing that I noticed was that no one was wearing masks. The people behind the counter were not wearing masks. The people directing us were not wearing masks. No one of the staff was wearing masks. This tiny counter was basically, <clears throat> do you have, or are you vaccinated? Yes, no. I am fully vaccinated. I have been for six months now. But according to Norway, I am not vaccinated because they do not accept vaccination records from anywhere outside of Europe. This is really dumb, by the way. This is absolutely a criticism of the Norwegian government. Pretty much no one else in the EU does it this way. Pretty much no one else in the Nordic coalition does it this way. In Norway, they will accept American vaccination records if you have a national ID. If you don't, go screw yourself. I do not understand that at all. Sure, you want to not allow Americans in because it is dangerous? Fine, that is your purview. That's perfectly acceptable in my mind. You have exceptions to the rule. I am one of the exceptions. That's great. You should have exceptions. There are situations where even though there's a risk, you're willing to accept that risk, especially if they can prove that they're vaccinated. That's fine. That's how I got into Germany, for instance. But... By not accepting, by not allowing somebody to prove their vaccination records well in advance, far enough in advance where you're not checking them at the border, but you're checking them well in advance and giving them the, hey, look, you have proof, here's your digital QR code, go. By not allowing that to happen, all you're actually doing is discriminating against people who can't get Norwegian national IDs which is a problem in Norway, because Norway has some of the strictest immigration laws in the world. Uh, Japan beats them. That's about it. And as somebody who is emigrating from the U.S. and immigrating to Norway, oh boy, am I pissed off at that. I'm going to have to do this again, for reference. Even though I'm now in Norway, I cannot go on a ferry. It is not allowed. I have to take the bus even though I am not leaving Norway, the country. If I were to leave Norway and then come back in, I have to go through quarantine again. Even if I am going to a country that is considered green on the EU list of um, infection rate, which is to say they have effectively no COVID spread. There aren't any green countries right now for reference, but back when there were, even if I were to go into that country, then come back, I would still have to go through quarantine again. Why? It's not actually controlling COVID. You'll notice that I mentioned that nobody's wearing masks. In fact, I have not met any Norwegian personnel, as in people working for airports, hotels, or the Norwegian government, that I first met wearing a mask. What? Norway, specific parts of Norway, have a higher infection rate than Madison, Wisconsin right now. Uh, I'm not in those parts right now for reference. Uh, Bergen area has a lower infection rate than Oslo or any of the other areas that have, that are in crisis, so to speak, but this is easily preventable. Why are you not doing it? I, I don't understand. This entire endeavor has been one boondoggle after another. From the, yes, we're requiring you to wear N95 masks or KN95 masks, please buy them. Oh, by the way, here's a free, cheap, flimsy, non-medical grade mask that we said wasn't allowed. We're allowing it. To... The fact that the stringest mask policy that I've dealt with the entire time from point A to point B on this trip was the bus trip? A bus trip? Where they were actually catching people doing like the hanging nose over a mask type of thing and telling them to put their mask over their nose like a real person? 
they didn't even mention that anywhere else. And when I arrived in Bergen Airport, the people that I did see wearing masks, which were primarily passengers, none of them were wearing their masks correctly. It was ridiculous. When I got to the main terminal area, which I'll talk about the area in between in a moment, but when I got to the main terminal area, no one was wearing a mask properly. <clears throat> so, I arrived in Bergen. I went to the area saying that I am not vaccinated. There were a few people in front of me. Um, eventually, there were two people in front of me, one of which actually followed me, the uh, both of which were actually on both the Frankfurt to Bergen trip along with the Chicago to Frankfurt trip. Um, one was an individual who is hard of hearing, which I cannot imagine trying to deal with that while also masking, because now you're not leading, le uh, reading lips which I have enough problems because I can't read lips. I can't imagine somebody fully on the hard of hearing dealing with that. And another person who tried to carry their way into the country. Um, I'm pretty sure they got denied at the border because I didn't see them at the testing facility. And I was there for a while. Uh, the hard of hearing person I did see at the testing facility not too long after I got in, so... Um, the person who was trying to carry their way in claimed that they had no idea that there were entry regulations against Americans and had no idea that Norway wasn't accepting American proof of vaccination. First off, I was warned by the airline when I had booked my flight saying, hey, look, Americans aren't allowed in Norway. Are you sure you want to book this flight? Then, when I submitted my proof of vaccination to the airline, they had mentioned, hey, look, Americans are not actually allowed into Norway normally. We don't know if we want to be able to book your seat. And I had to go in again in order to actually get booked on the seat. That was twice, in my case, that I got warned in advance about it. Even if I had zero knowledge about anything else, I would have known at those two times. Now, I obviously researched well in advance because I've been waiting for this time for a while. And I also knew that Norway didn't accept American proof of vaccination. Sure, I had a, you know, a prayer that they would actually accept it in my case, but I knew they weren't going to. That's fine. Well, I already ranted about that, but still, whatever. I knew about it well in advance. Uh, you could tell the, the visible relief on the guard's face when I had mentioned, I am fully vaccinated, but I am American, and I recognize that Norway doesn't accept, accept my vaccination. I am fully accept to be going into a quarantine hotel for the next three days. There was visible relief on the face, because that was the same person who was dealing with Karen right in front of me. And the Karen was just off to the side, fuming the entire time. I wanted to laugh, but I'm trying to be nice, and I was also really tired. So... After going through that, now, to be fair, the guard was had plexiglass between me and the guard, so it was actually fairly safe, but not wearing a mask. Neither were the people directing us to there, one of which was behind me, within a meter away from me. If I was actually infected with COVID, they would have gotten infected. If they weren't vaccinated, at least. So, okay get directed to their testing facility. Their testing facility was huge. Like, large auditorium huge. There were three people there for being tested. There were three staff members there for the lab slash registration. There were seven people there to direct around. The people who were dealing with labs and registration were the only people I saw masked properly and oh boy were they treating their ppe properly but then again they're a testing facility they should the people that were the guards directing us there on the other hand were completely unmasked of the pe three people that were there which rotated while i was there because you have to wait for the test results and it's a 20 minute wait not too bad um of the people that were there there was myself there was the person who was hard of hearing uh, there was a person who spoke Norwegian, but um, 
looked to have been a medical case where they may not have been vaccinated because of medical reasons. And there was one Norwegian there that I'm not sure why she wasn't vaccinated. Might have been a personal preference type of thing. Don't know, because this was apparently the third time this week that she had gone through this. But, okay, got through, got my testing results. It's negative, by the way. I do not have COVID, at least as of that test. I need to take another test at the end of this quarantine. But, okay. Then I got redirected, uh, directed out and told, okay, what you need to do is that you need to pick up your bag and you're going to be going to the Skende Kokstad. Kokstad is the suburb of Bergen that I'm in right now, technically. Uh, the airport itself is not actually in Bergen, which makes the Bergen sign all the more hilarious because the answer to that question is no. Um, <laughs> but, okay, so pick up bags and go to the information desk. Mind you, I'm still carrying that really heavy bag, but I arrived at the international baggage area to no one there. No one at all. I was the only person in the entire baggage area. There were no representatives. There was no person to ask questions about. There was no random other people walking around. It was just me when I arrived. Eventually, one of the group, uh, one of the three people that were testing with me came out in that area. I eventually found my bag, but more importantly, I found a cart. I can finally put my bags on a cart and not have to carry around the stupid heavy bag anymore. That felt so nice. Okay, got into the cart go through customs again. Uh, customs in Bergen is always an interesting experience because nobody's ever there. The Bergen airport is bigger than the Madison airport at this point, but there might be fewer passengers going through it and almost certainly less staff. Um, I have never had a passport stamp from Bergen. Ever. I still don't. <laughs> Even though I had to go through all of the COVID stuff, I still have no evidence that I've ever arrived in this place. <sighs> I gotta love it. Um, anyway, go through the nothing to declare, and I'm in the main area, where, again, nobody's masked. Or nobody's masked properly, at least. Okay, need to go to the information desk. Fun fact, there is no information desk in the Bergen Airport. There's nobody around to ask questions. There's a lost and found area, but the office was closed. Mind you, I, by this point, it was like 12.30 p.m. on a Wednesday. There's no reason for that to be closed. It was just closed. They didn't feel like staffing it. Um, and in fact, the only places that I found any staffing at in the floor that I was on were the rental car places. And I asked them, hey, look, where's the information desk? And I kept getting the same answers of, I don't know. Again, nobody masked. I made sure that I stood back two meters away, and usually I made sure that there was a piece of plastic between me and the people I was asking questions about, which there wasn't always plexiglass around to do this. I swear nobody in, nobody in the airport cared about the damn coronavirus. So I go upstairs. Upstairs is where arrivals are at. And I knew there had to have been staff around just because, seriously, it's an airport. They, they need staff. I went up to the testing facility there. They had never seen an information desk. I eventually found airport staff, which once more, no one wearing masks. And the airport staff eventually went, we have no information desk, just take a cab. So I took a cab here which I'm not technically supposed to do. Um, it does say that if I absolutely have to, I can take transportation as long as it's not public transportation. I absolutely had to, so I justified it under those orders. And I had told the people when I arrived here what I did, and they nodded and had no issues with it. But what? <laughs> That's why this quarantine is so dumb. Here I am. I am fully vaccinated. Um... I recognize that it is possible for me to be infected, even though I am vaccinated. It's a lower chance, but it can happen, especially since I was vaccinated six months ago, and effectiveness for preventing it entirely does decrease over time, whereas effectiveness for preventing serious infection does not, at least at the moment, that's the way it appears to be. 
So it's possible that I could pick up the coronavirus during my travels. However, I was probably masked the entire time. Uh, the passengers that I was with outside of the flight from Frankfurt to Bergen were probably masked the entire time, both for the bus trip and for the flight, no hair. Everybody on hair was properly masked, which shocked me. I had been warned about, that's one of the reasons why I didn't want to lay over in O'Hare was because I didn't want to deal with the terminal. The terminal was going to be the highest risk place that I was going to be at. Everybody was properly masked. Frankfurt, most people were properly masked. Uh, not everybody, but I tried to stay away from the people who weren't. So the place that I had the actual highest risk of getting infected from COVID was the Bergen Airport. I have proof that I am vaccinated, but Norway doesn't recognize it, which means that I have to go into quarantine. My quarantine hotel, nobody was masked. The next most likely place that I have to get infected from COVID-19 is my own quarantine hotel. Now, in quarantine, I am not allowed contact with anybody else. And I haven't had contact with anybody else. Uh, the most that I've done is call the front desk, and that was earlier today. But that was just a call, a phone call, obviously. I'm not going to be able to infect somebody through a phone. Um, there's nobody that comes by to clean these rooms. I am just to clean it myself, and that's fine. I don't want anybody to come by to clean these rooms right now. I don't know if you can hear all of the sleet hitting the window. Uh, the weather here has been a little weird. Anyway, um... Basically, what I'm getting at is that the quarantine requirements of the country of Norway are the thing most likely to get me infected with COVID-19. Cool. Good job trying to prevent that, Norway. And keep in mind, I'm American. My country's done a horrible job at trying to keep this contained. In fact, it didn't even try initially. So I've had to take a lot of extra measures myself. Wow, that is really noisy. I have no idea if you're able to hear me or not. Probably. Doesn't help with the light situation, but it helps a little with the audio. So, that's where I'm at right now. I am frustrated from Norway. There's been a lot of criticism that says that Norway's regulations, which, mind you, they barely comply with the... Um, Schengen Agreement. I know I'm saying that wrong. I'm terrible at pronouncing that word. Uh, they barely comply. Norway basically had to have their arm twisted in order to even allow for countries outside of the Nordic Union. In citizens of countries of people outside the earth. From people outside the Nordic Union uh, to be allowed entrance into the country. And to me, it more speaks to xenophobia than it does actually preventing the infection. And everything that I'm seeing reinforces that. <sighs> but I am complying with said guidelines. Technically, uh, according to the guidelines, I am allowed to take a walk. But, well... The sleet stopped hitting my window. Um, well, sleet outside. I'm not going to walk outside in that. The most that I have left this hotel room has been to grab the food that's on the opposite side of the door or grab the food that's down the hallway. But this hallway is the quarantine area. Whenever I leave the room, I am masked. And I am the only one in the hallway when I do so. I actually peek out to make sure that nobody's in the hallway before leaving. If I see somebody in the hallway, I immediately close my door, even though I'm masked. Because again, I'm supposed to be in quarantine. They are treating me as though I am infected. That's fine. I'm going to treat myself as though I'm infected to make sure that nobody else gets hurt because nobody else is wearing a mask. I don't know. Personally, I was not expecting Norway to be the country that was the most anti-mask of the areas that I was traveling between. I expected to see a large number of people anti-mask on the bus trip. The bus had signs everywhere saying that you were required to wear a mirror mask over your nose and mouth. And that violators would be issued a federal fine and kicked off the bus. 
nobody was kicked off, mind you, but people were yelled at to make sure that they complied with the over-the-nose part. The airport, it's the same guidelines for reference. In the United States, it's all controlled by the um, TSA, Transportation Safety Administration, which for once is actually doing, or Transportation Security Administration, which is actually doing security for once. It's weird. Also, the TSA is the federal group heaviest anti-fax in the U.S. Anyway, um, they were at least complying with all the regulations and enforcing them. So the next least problematic area that I went through was the airport, uh, the Chicago airport. Then the flight from Chicago is basically every step of the way became less safe for me and everyone else. I don't get it. So yeah, that's been the boondoggle that I've been dealing with. I've been yammering on for over an hour now. Can you tell I have nothing to do? <laughs> um, next couple of days, I'm probably going to try to record some Vandal Hearts videos. I actually do have access to my home network now, although it's being wonky. But I have downloaded Vandal Hearts. I have downloaded a copy of the front cover of the game, so I have everything required in order for me to record more videos. I do have proper internet access in here now. Turns out there was a quarantine Wi-Fi network, and it changed sometime between yesterday and today, where instead of getting about 5 to 8 megabit, I'm now getting 45 megabit, which is the maximum that the Wi-Fi can handle, and I'm getting it in both directions. So I wonder if they just migrated the... And I'm so on a, on a different network, I should say like different internet provider. So I'm wondering if they actually just switched the hotel over to fiber. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be recording some of those. I'm probably going to start after my job interview today because that's in an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay at the moment. Although hotel kept giving me egg. So um, just an aside, um, they, when you are in a quarantine hotel, it is a taxpayer funded or taxpayer subsidized effort, which is I'm paying 500 kroner a day, which is about 60 bucks. And it includes the room and meals. It's apparently four meals a day and not three like it's supposed to be, uh, so I am actually being fed more than I was eating prior to leaving. I wasn't eating all that much, to be fair. And they had asked me if there were any restrict dietary restrictions. Um, specific the dietary restrictions or any reasons why you might not want to eat a certain type of food. And I had mentioned pork. Um, I don't have any problems with people that like bacon or anything like that. I mean, bacon's delicious, don't get me wrong. But pork's right on that line where I start feeling like... So there's a famous PETA billboard that constantly gets derided out of where do you draw the line between pet and food and I do draw that line the problem is that the line goes right through the middle of a pig so there's part of me that starts seeing pigs more as pets instead of food so I have some minor issues with eating of pork but again that's me personally I don't care if other people eat pork so I just said no pork unfortunately there's another type of food that I don't eat and that's eggs um, that's not for any moral reason or anything. I can't handle the texture. And also, I can't stand the taste. Or smell. But it's mostly a texture thing for me. Unfortunately, it appears as though all of the non-pork meals that they've been giving have been very heavy in egg. Uh, my lunch today was a giant, delicious-looking omelet. I couldn't stomach even a bite. So I had to call down to the desk and tell them, Can you also add no eggs to that, please? I didn't think about that, and pretty much every meal that I've had has had a hard-boiled egg included, just for fun. <sighs> yeah, I haven't had any protein today. Anyway, I'm going to disconnect now and hang up and stop talking because my mouth is really dry. I need more water. I'll see you tomorrow, Internet. Bye.